Senator Dan McConchie, thanks for joining us on the All Night Channel. Good to see you. And normally you and I would be together in Springfield this time of year, and we would be looking forward to uh, approaching the end of the legislative session. And most of the focus would be on what's going to be in the state budget, which is normally going to be passed at the end of May. But here we are, as everyone knows now, in the middle of this coronavirus shutdown. And as we, you and I are taping this, uh, yesterday the governor issued his plan to uh, reopen Illinois. He calls it Restore Illinois. So we wanted to get your analysis of it. You, you had some points that you posted on Facebook that I thought were pretty interesting. Uh, at least on Facebook is where I saw them. Give us, if you would, a thumbnail of, of what you, uh, how you're reacting to what the governor proposed yesterday. Well, it's really good to be with you today. And, uh, you know, I feel for all of your viewers and listeners out there who are suffering under this current environment, it's a, a terrible situation. You know, it, I have advocated for weeks that the governor come up with a plan, a plan that would help give some foresight and some certainty for people to be able to say how much longer are we going to be in this what are the metrics that are necessary uh, for us to be able to get back and start to move toward norm life again and do so safely unfortunately when the governor you know when he put out his plan i at first i was happy i was uh, pleased that he had finally uh, listened and come out with a plan and then i read the specifics and there are a number of areas that are just extremely problematic uh, for the one-size-fits-all kind of manner in which he has approached the state so far. For example, he decided that he was going to start doing regions in the state. Now, we have 11 uh, emergency medical regions uh, in the state to help manage uh, our medical capacity. He consolidated these 11 regions down into four. Uh, really no kind of rhyme or reason as to why he did that. Let me comment that New York, uh, which is a state that's uh, about 18 percent or so smaller than us, uh, has 10 regions as a part of their reopening plan. Uh, we're a very large geographically diverse state and there is no reason to have large swaths of the state being treated equally um, regardless of whether or not they are in a major metropolitan area or in very rural areas. So that is one big concern that I have. Uh, there's a number of other concerns that we have as well. One is the fact that the governor continues to treat uh, retail establishments differently, especially discriminating against small business. So right now I can go to a Walmart and buy clothing, but I can't go to a clothing store. I can go to Target and buy furniture, but I can't go to a furniture store. I can go to my grocery store coming up here on Mother's Day and buy flowers, but I can't go to a florist. I can't go inside to a florist shop. And that kind of discriminatory behavior, e even if these entities are able to operate safely, they're still being treated differently. And that is really problematic because not only is it inconvenient for regular folks to be able to go out and try to get the things that they need, it discriminates against small businesses and will necessarily result in fewer jobs and fewer businesses at the end of the day. It's very concerning. What are you hearing from your business community and, and in general, just the uh, the people you represent uh, in your district? Well, there's a number of things. One is a great deal of fear, right? There's a, a great deal of fear that these businesses, uh, you know, they're not going to be able to survive. That is uh, the real concern that a lot of them have. So we another provision of this plan is that you can't move from one stage to the next of further reopening uh, but a, you have a review once every 28 days that's double uh, the length of time of review for any other state that is considering you know how they're going to best reopen uh, there, so there's a lot of fear about those types of things that are out there uh, some of them are saying you know they're going to open up in contravention of the governor's order because their alternative is bankruptcy and that is a terrible choice that they are being forced into. And this is something that, you know, I think the governor has made his decisions really kind of based in a vacuum and in a bubble that it seems with him and his small group of uh, hand selected experts that he's had. I think that, that yeah, subjecting his annual uh, or his, his periodic ex, uh, executive orders to legislative oversight is what's desperately needed right now. It is the wisdom that comes from 
uh, the big group of elected officials representing the entire state, representing people from all walks of life across our diverse area that is going to help come to the best possible solution. Uh, and unfortunately, the governor has taken a go, go it alone tactic so far. I want to bring up a uh, graphic here that uh, kind of addresses one of the points or question I have. And if, as we see here, you, you wrote, getting to full reopening will take nine to 15 months under the governor's plan, which means he will need to continually issue emergency declarations to see the plan through, each of which grants him virtually unlimited authority for the 30 days each one is in effect. Uh, but you know, the question that I have is, when the governor has this emergency authority, I don't even know that it's a rolling 30 days. Maybe you know what the actual provision is. Uh, it was my understanding once he declares an emergency, he had 30 days, and then the legislature would have to reauthorize uh, his use of that authority. Or, or is it automatic every time he declares, makes a uh, declaration? So the statute is silent in regards to what happens after uh, he issues an emergency declaration after 30 days. So he issues a declaration, it lasts for 30 days, then it expires, but the governor is able just to simply reissue a new emergency declaration, completely upon his own authority, uh, completely based upon his own criteria. There is no, we are one of 19 states that provide zero oversight of the governor's ability to, to declare and renew emergency declarations. Uh, most states, uh, there are nine states that either require the legislature to initially approve or approve subsequent declarations. Uh, there are then about 20 states, 22 states I believe it is, that allow for the legislature to step in and nullify a emergency declaration when one is done. However, we are the we are one of, uh, as I mentioned, 19 states that has zero oversight from the legislative branch over the governor. So the only type of oversight that exists is whether or not somebody decides they want to challenge his orders. It's kind of surprising with the governor and the Illinois Channel has been carrying his uh, his uh, press briefings live every afternoon as well as putting them up on YouTube for review. Uh, but we really haven't heard much from those in the legislature from the Republican Party. So that's why we're so grateful that you could join us today. So I would say that the governor in the early stages, you know, he was operating with very little information, doing his best to really try to, to make that difficult balance that exists in uh, when you're trying to manage a natural disaster, uh, like you know, such as like this, where you have an unseen enemy. And, and I have no uh, qualms with what he did in his early days. The issue is, is that he has continued to maintain a go it alone approach in which, yeah, you can offer advice, but at the end of the day, he is going to be the only one that makes the decisions as to what it is that we're gonna do going forward. Look, we have three branches of government uh, for a reason. That those three branches of government help provide oversight over each other. Right now, we only have one branch of government that is making decisions as to freedom of movement, how much commerce can go uh, and, and, and operate. And that is, uh, that, that is a recipe for disaster long term. We need that check and balance system in normal times. It's even more necessary in a crisis like this. And, and what is fundamentally necessary is to ensure that the decisions that he's making uh, are something that the public buys into. And that is something that would happen if he included uh, a broader base of support, uh, a broader base kind of decision-making authority by bringing the legislature into the mix. Uh, by his not doing it, everybody's looking just at the decisions that he's made and he is going to put bear uh, kind of the consequences, the political consequences of whatever happens, good or bad, right, in, in regards to that. And I think that, you know, the, the value of our government, uh, of our divided system of government, is that diversity of opinion that comes when you have multiple people from different walks of life at the table and not just one person making all of the decisions. The governor has said in some of his press briefings that he has talked to any number of people and he alludes to the fact that he's talked to different uh, Republicans. Uh, have you had any conversations? Has he reached out to you for any advice? I have not heard from the governor. We have uh, sent a number of letters or, or other things such as plans. I worked with Senator Paul Schimpf, 
uh, to come up with a reopening plan. We submitted that to him, oh, I don't know, a week or 10 days ago. Um, there was no response to that. Uh, we've sent letters encouraging further transparency, uh, asking questions about uh, prisoners who have been released from prison, violent criminals who have been given clemency during under COVID-19. We've asked for some clarity on those things. There's been no response. Uh, so I, he may be talking to some folks. Uh, if so, I don't know who they are. When we uh, look at the governor's plan, which, which he calls Restore Illinois, of course, it's about getting this economy back open primarily. I want to bring up another graphic that uh, people can just kind of use to uh, assess any plan. And as we look at this, uh, we see the, uh, the deaths group by age. And uh, what we are seeing is that the, the vast majority, in fact, something like 80% of those who are dying of the, the virus are over the age of uh, 65. When you throw in 55 age group, you're at about 92%. So a, a good number of those people who are dying here uh, are not probably not even in the workforce or are nearing retirement. And I've wondered how many people who are 55 years old or so uh, could could be working, but if they're selling insurance or financial advice or consulting, I mean, they could, or even lawyers, you know, they could be working from home and doing what you and I are now doing and communicating over, online. Uh, with that in mind, just as far as this age group, are, are we, as you said, the governor is not, when he looks at these regions, He's throwing, and one of the points you made, that he's throwing McHenry County, which is more, uh, you know, low population. He's treating it in the same region as Chicago. Is he also failing, in your estimation, to distinguish by age group? So what the governor has stated is that he is kind of keeping, you know, limiting movement by younger people. Because even though they may not uh, really, you know, have, have, be at serious risk themselves, they do have interactions with folks that are older. I think the biggest issue that we have in regards to the data that was in the chart that you just showed is the manner in which we count COVID-19 deaths. And this is something that Dr. Azike uh, said, I think a week or so ago, in one of the press conferences that the governor had. And that is that those deaths are if you die with COVID not if you die from COVID, right? And she gave the example that if someone dies who is in a hospice, you know, they are, they're terminally ill, they contract COVID and die, they are counted as a COVID death, right? So we actually do not have good data as to how many people are dying from COVID versus dying with COVID. That is really important, right? Because it, it may be that there are people who are dying with COVID, but are really dying of other things that really makes the virus less uh, virulent and deadly from a public health standpoint than what people are thinking when they look at those numbers. You know, Senator, we talked about, like I say, businesses that are uh, on the verge of le uh, perhaps going out of business if we don't reopen faster than perhaps the governor is proposing. Uh, there's two points I would make. One, in the U.S. Constitution, we have the takings clause. If the government says you can't operate and therefore I lose my business, that might have been worth a million dollars if I wanted to sell it. Is the state then going to be, under the takings clause, sued and say you're going to have to compensate me for the loss of my business because it was under your order? Uh, that that I was forced to shut down and lose the value of my business I built. So that's number one. And number two, the state is losing, as the governor has noted, billions of dollars. You had a, a budget briefing, as I understand it, just earlier today. What kind of long-term damage? We often think of you know the business community, but what kind of long-term damage are we going to be doing to the state of Illinois? to the municipalities uh, therein. Uh, assess all of that, if you would, for us. So in regards to lawsuits, uh, you know, we do not know that this is uh, an unusual circumstance. Definitely, I I'm certain there will be many lawsuits that are filed making all sorts of claims, uh, both in state and federal court. Uh, we'll have to see kind of what happens with those, uh, but certainly those are coming uh, in, in a variety of ways. 
Uh, repeat your second question. Well, the the question is, um, what about the state? We instead of just thinking about oh, the loss of right. businesses with the billions of dollars, as everyone knows, this state was in dire financial situation prior to the coronavirus coming out. Our pensions are among the worst funded in the nation. Uh, what, what, when you look at the new reality that we are in, uh, the state of Illinois and, and municipalities, uh, Chicago is just one obvious example, uh, that has some of the lowest funded pensions anywhere. I think their fire and police are down to around 15, 18% funded of where they should be. What's going to be so happening? What is this, you know, you're a member of the legislature to point out the obvious. What's going to be happening financially and to the extent that we have a, an economic threat, as I say, it's not just to the private sector, it's also to the ability of government to function. So just based on the budget issue alone, we, we run an annual budget of around 40, 40 and a half billion dollars a year. The last numbers that I saw uh, wow. that uh, projected losses in revenue for next year is about 4.2 billion, right? Uh, I think that that may be even a little bit optimistic, but it's a huge cut that we're going to have to try to, to figure out, like how, how do we balance the budget and what are we going to do? And, and there's gonna be cuts in, in virtually all areas, some very significant, some very painful. And the issue, and this gets back to my issue earlier when I talked about the fact that the governor is operating without any sort of legislative oversight. I think that if he had brought in the legislature to help him with this decision-making process, the, the natural thing would have been probably a better, uh, probably a better decision-making process, probably more businesses being able to be open, more jobs that would be able to be maintained and businesses will be able to be kept. And as a result, more revenue that would be coming into the state. Uh, and so in part, I think that the kind of myopic decision making that has happened uh, to date is going to result in actually a worse situation for state finances than might have otherwise been the case. And you mentioned pensions. Pensions is gonna be a really big issue uh, coming forward. We already have a massive unfunded pension liability uh, you know, at least $130 billion, and some estimates over $200 billion. With the market now declined, right, we're even further in the hole in regards to that. And so the pensions systems are, have been uh, are in bad circumstances because of chronic underfunding. They're even worse now due to market conditions. And so that, uh, you know, the, the issue with the, our current budget, it does not even take that terrible, terrible situation into account. How often do you talk with uh, members of the legislature? To what extent have, have you been able, not just as one individual, have you and your uh, fellow lawmakers been able to kind of stay informed when you're so diversified here and broken up? Uh, and, and what's the assessment of, of others that you talk to on either side of the aisle? Well, there's a lot of concern, uh, both sides of the aisle in regards to, you know, how are we going to kind of solve the budget issue? The, we, we meet daily, every day, 9 a.m. Uh, we have a call in which we go through and get another area of the budget, try to figure out where we've been spending money, what's it been on, what can be cut, what needs to be maintained, what sort of areas that, you know, there are federal rules or matching funds that are available that we need to try to make sure that we capitalize on. Uh, you know, one interesting thing is, is that the CARES Act, the federal bill that helped uh, provide, you know, some of the bailout money that has come to the state actually comes with a lot of rules and a lot of strings attached. So, for example, in education, we cannot uh, dramatically reduce support for K-12 education or higher ed because we accepted federal money, right? Uh, there's other areas in which the federal rules, because we've accepted those funds, are going to be uh, you know, limit our ability to be able to balance the budget. And, you know, so there may be situations in which uh, we have to cut other areas even more than, you know, what might uh, have normally been the case because our hands are tied because of what the feds have done and, and the rules that they've associated with their bailout money. I know the governor has said that he's not going to consider uh, any changes in the pension system. Some 
uh, critics, the people from WirePoints as one example, are saying that uh, the state ought to be able to declare bankruptcy or that the, the legislature ought to pass a bill to allow Chicago to declare bankruptcy. We've heard from Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader in Washington, talk about allowing states to declare bankruptcy. Uh, do you have any thoughts on either allowing uh, the, the Illinois legislature, allowing municipalities to declare bankruptcy, uh, or should the states be allowed to? Uh, and, and while we're looking ahead, we have a constitutional amendment that's going to be on the ballot. The governor wants to go to a progressive tax. How, to has all of this, in your estimation, uh, impacted the governor's plan to go to a progressive tax? I, I think on the one hand, you're going to have the governor make the argument in regards to the graduated tax that this is needed now, you know, kind of more than ever because of the reduction in, in income. Uh, I think there's going to be a question of trust. We have not uh, taken care of our budget for decades, you know, the pensions being a great example of that. Uh, I think that the idea of trusting Springfield is probably not going to be really high on people's list right now, especially when they understand that there's a certain set of rates and uh, brackets as far as you know this graduated tax that it would go into effect if it got passed but that can be changed at any point in time in the future without the voters weighing in uh, those rates and brackets could change and, and come down and, and begin to pull people from the middle class uh, up into those higher brackets we already have one of the largest exoduses from illinois uh, you know uh, our, the biggest exodus of kind of in, almost any state in the union and that is uh, something that we have to be very concerned about we don't want to further push people out and then the question of bankruptcy that has been on the table for a while now people have kind of talked about that I think everything needs to be on the table because it is simply not possible to tax our way out of the budget problems that we have now. Uh, Detroit went through bankruptcy and has been able to come out on the other end. Uh, this may be what's necessary in order to help tame Chicago's debt. Uh, I know that they say it's not on the table, but at some point, you know, we don't have the ability to print money. Uh, we don't have the ability to, you know, simply borrow from China in unlimited sums like the federal government has and has done and continues to do. We have very limited abilities to be able to uh, really make our, you know, bring more income in uh, without being more competitive, which has been something that uh, the majority party has been unwilling to do to date. We have different states that have uh, been reopening in some measure faster than Illinois has been. We're still very early in that process. As you noted in your criticism of the governor's plan, it might take 9 to 15 months, according to Governor Pritzker's plan, now, the governor does say if, if something were to change, if a vaccine and we're fast tracking some of these approaches, if that were to come out, then we could do it faster. But uh, will a number one, as other states open uh, faster than we do, is that going to put more pressure on uh, Governor Pritzker and economically on Illinois to to reopen? So we already have an issue with people leaving the state to go across the border to buy gas. Uh, and so forth just because of our tax rates, right? Uh, people are now going across the border to get haircuts and other services that they currently can't get locally. So we're already pushing people that are in the border communities to go across the border. And that is something that's very concerning. I do think that when you have other states, they're gonna open up faster. Uh, the governor has already indicated a, uh, what I'll tell you say is a very go slow approach. Uh, as those other states open up, if they do not have a spike in cases, if they're able to manage uh, their hospital uh, bed utilization and things like that, uh, well, I think that is going to put a lot of pressure on Illinois. Otherwise, you're going to continue to have uh, both temporary and permanent exoduses of people who are simply saying, I can uh, live safely and do commerce and have a job you know, someplace else. Uh, why am I going to stay here? That That is a, a difficult balance that the governor uh, is going to be weighing, and I think it's one that he should not be making alone. Senator, the other thing, uh, Senator Don Harmon recently wrote a, a letter in which he was requesting basically a federal bailout, as I recall, it was in the neighborhood of something like $41 billion. Apparently, uh, he did not ask uh, Governor Pritzker. Uh, he, he did that on his own accord. Uh, 
what what do you think uh, is, is a federal bailout something that the state should be uh, looking to have? So he threw everything and the kitchen sink uh, into that request that he put forward. I mean, he asked for $10 billion for our underfunded pension system, uh, which is ridiculous, right? Because the, the issue with our pension systems has nothing to do with the uh, coronavirus. It is, you know, everything to do with our long-term fiscal mismanagement. Now, asking for help and support in, in regards to uh, the various things, especially those things the federal government has essentially forced states to go out and do, I, I think is appropriate. Uh, the issue in Senator Harmon's or President Harmon's letter is the size and the types of things that he threw into that, uh, some of which were inappropriate. Uh, I know of members of the other party uh, who uh, not only, you know, that, that he represents that, that evidently didn't know about it till the letter went out. Um, you know, this is something that I think is very problematic. And we've seen that in the response from the president, right? The, re the president was essentially like, you know, this is ridiculous. I'm not sure why we would, you know, have people from other states bail out poorly run states at all, right? And I think that the letter may have undermined our ability to be able to get uh, a reasonable level of assistance from the federal government uh, by asking for such unrealistic things and at such unrealistic levels. Senator, I, it, w there's not a whole lot of uh, reason for optimism. Um, I don't know how Illinois gets out of this. Uh, if you have any closing thoughts, I'd be happy to have them, but otherwise we'll We'll say goodbye. So I would just say that I think th this dem this situation demonstrates the importance of having a diverse uh, group of people who are involved in the legislating process, in the governing process, right? It is uh, we, the more diverse that your group is, the, the more different, interesting, and useful ideas that come up that are evaluated. Uh, the types of things that we've seen, the types of decisions that have been made by the governor in this case, uh, really demonstrate what happened if you don't have that diversity at the table, right? The, uh, the, the limit, for example, if you go boating, that you can only have two people on a boat at a time, regardless of how many people are in your house and sharing dinner together right. and watching TV together, you know, how many people that can go golfing together, again, for the same types of, uh, of limitations. Uh, you know, there, there's a smarter way to do it. But th that smarter way comes about when we all get together and do it together and not go it alone. I, I, I just recall that I, I should have asked, we're supposed to have a budget passed by June, uh, well, by uh, May, the end of May, uh, the new budget year starts July 1. Have you heard anything about how you're going to pass a budget? How are we going to fund the state uh, going into the new fiscal year? Can you get a budget passed? And has, has anyone talked about, we somewhat touched on it earlier, but has anyone talked about where are you going to make the cuts to accommodate the $4 billion or more in loss of revenue? So those discussions are ongoing. There's a lot of ideas that are being put on the table. It's very um, difficult to kind of know kind of where exactly we're going to end up. Uh, the budget has to be passed by the Constitution, has to be passed by the end of May. If it doesn't, uh, then, you know, it has to it'll go to a supermajority required vote. Uh, but, you know, I would say to date, our budget meetings have been collegial. They've been informative. I do think that there is a strong possibility that we can put together a bipartisan budget. The one thing that I will caution people on is that it will be a budget that is going to be somewhat of a guess, right? I mean, we do not, we're not through this crisis yet. We do not know what the long-term impacts are going to be on revenues to the state. Uh, we're going to have to kind of take our best guess in regards to that. And the governor through the next year and per perhaps longer is going to have to actively manage our expenditures along with the comptroller because it could be that, you know, we make an estimate and yet we're either wildly optimistic or wildly pessimistic. There's just no crystal ball for a situation like this uh, that is going to give a lot of clarity. Well, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to when we can get back to normal and uh, the Illinois Channel will be covering 
the legislature when you finally do get back together and, and try to pass it. We know for sure it's not going to be an easy task, it never is, but certainly much more difficult under the uh, current circumstances. Senator Dan McConchie, thanks so much for joining us and we'll look forward to talking to you again in the near future. Thanks for having me on and be safe. Thanks for watching and if you haven't already, please consider subscribing to our channel. And while you're at it, please leave us a comment. Thank you for watching.